everybody. And welcome. Uh, my name is Ellen David Friedman. I am very proud to be here to host this webinar. I'm a member of the uh, board of Labor Notes. Labor Notes, as uh, many listeners will know, is a 40-year-old uh, media and education project. We publish a monthly magazine, books, uh, conferences, educational events, and so on, and have tried to keep alive for these 40 years the incredibly important impulse of uh, radical uh, rank and file um, democratic unionism, both in the U.S. and wherever and wherever we see it bringing up around the entire world. Um, it is an impulse which, in our darkest times of economic inequality, uh, always proves itself to be invaluable, and we see it again on the rise in recent years. Um, tonight, we have a, a very unique opportunity. I'm quite grateful to the uh, three other sisters in our labor movement who have joined us to be able to talk about a, um, an, an extraordinary uh, event, uh, event that many of us have watched unfold over the last, um, over the last almost, almost five months in which um, people have been taking their, their lives, their fates, their livelihoods, um, their physical well-being into their hands uh, week, after week after week in Hong Kong, uh, sometimes as many as one or two million people on the street um, demanding the preservation and, in fact, an expansion of their democratic rights of speech, of assembly, um, and of political representation. This is a moment of unparalleled uh, militancy in modern history. We've seen signs of this form of grassroots spontaneous insurgency um, growing continuously since the financial crisis in 2008, uh, but we have not ever seen something this sustained, uh, this emergent and mature as it keeps changing and adapting to the forms of repression it faces. So we are here tonight um, to learn more about this, specifically to learn about it from a perspective um, that is not, is not most often uh, paid attention to in the media, and that is to focus um, on the questions of inequality, uh, economic privilege, and economic want that have apparently made uh, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers willing to take tremendous risks. Um, we're going to explore some of that background and what the labor environment is in Hong Kong and the role and relationship of workers, both organized and unorganized workers in Hong Kong, by first turning to Carol Ping, who is the president of the Federation in Hong Kong, or the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions. This is, uh, uh, there are two federations of trade unions in Hong Kong. Um, the other one is uh, HKCTU, is, is understood to be uh, the one affiliated with the mainland government. Uh, HKCTU is a central player in the pro democracy movement in Hong Kong and has been for many years. Uh, Carol, welcome. And um, we'd like to ask you to start us off, if you can, uh, by giving us a sort of a general background the economic and political conditions you believe has led to this, um, the role that HKCTU has played in helping to build the movement. Um, before we turn to you, um, I am hearing some considerable feedback from somebody or static in the background. We would ask if it's possible um, for other panelists to place themselves on mute while they're not speaking. That might help. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, Carol, please begin. Right. Okay. Um, just a, a very quick update um, so far, the situations, because there, uh, there were five demands um, developed since the movement. And uh, until today, these five demands, except only one, one point, um, have been met by the government, but the rest of the four are still not. 
So um, you can see nearly those uh, approved or non-approved rally or the protests happening each weekend. The clashes between the police and the activists um, have been increasingly violent, um, with, fire, with the police firing live bullets and protesters attacking officers and throwing petrol bombs and in some places which carrying um, strong Chinese capital behind. And um, in, whilst the city remained unrest, but the Hong Kong government decided to tighten its measures through a face mask ban legislation to ban everyone who hidden their identity under a mask during any kind of the protest. At the moment, none of the senior government officials, including the chief uh, executive, has the intention to resign or step down. And um, the police brutality is still occupying large amount of the complaints. Um, the protesters were treated by the excessive violence after arrest. Uh, victims came out at different occasions, openly accused, and they were suffer from different forms of torture during their detention, cases including sexually har uh, harassment and sexually assault in many ways. And uh, through the social media's of mobilization, large group of the young students and non-unionized workers started to consider the civil disobedience by strike actions of, for, um, together with the students, workers and business together. On the following days, um, 17 of June, 5th of August, um, 2nd and 3rd of September were the historical political strikes respectively in Hong Kong, which purposely given pressure to the Hong Kong government to respond to the five demands. One of the most successful day was on the 5th of August. Um, seven different assembly points in different places of Hong Kong who gathered over 350,000 workers and the public in one day, who actually crippled the operations at the airports and most of the public transports. At the arrest, um, the, um, those arrested protesters, including um, certain kinds of the young professionals, including young doctors, young nurses, and the young airlines employees. So you can imagine the retaliations from the government um, through different employment measures were initiated from the beginning of August. In particular, the Chinese Aviation Authority, um, CAAC, they, has they have warned Cathay Pacific Group um, at 9th of August 2019, that saying that um, Cathay Pacific having a safety risk warning. And they demand three points of the remarks towards this airline. Subsequently, the mass dismissal wave have begun. The current figure we know the number of the employee being dismissed uh, by um, different companies, including Cathay's group, has been reached at 36. And um, a new code of conduct in Cathay Pacific's group have, have been issued towards to the employee to encourage them to whistleblowing means to report each other. If you not supporting the government, um, colleagues, please report to the company, screen capture different personal social media um, accounts in order to report. And um, that is a new policy of the social media restrictions um, issued to the employees. So um, it, this is not the only situations ha happening in the employment field. The white terror it finally develops to uh, the medical care staffs in the public hospitals especially after those protesters, um, they need a treatment in the hospital uh, emergency care unit. And uh, some of the protesters being reported by a certain kind of different opinions and nursing staff. So um, they were arrested at the hospital. And also in the teachers, the education um, um, field, and the, um, the Secretary of um, Education in the um, government department issued a different kinds of um, communications towards the head teachers, um, different high schools principals, and especially the universities um, um, counselors. Then they are all telling the similar message is, um, let's support the government. Um, uh, do not allow these political situations develop um, in the schools. So different um, professions, they are under attack, um, under pressure. Unions in Hong Kong, um, we basically can fall into two main camps. Either belongs to HKCTU, 
the Hong Kong Confederations of Trade Unions, or the other one, HKFTU, which is Hong Kong Federations of Trade Unions. The former, which is a real democratic and independent trade union, and the latter, which is the pro-Beijing labor and political group, and the HKFTU, which is the pro-Beijing one, and they also have a very close communications and relationship with the ACFTU, the only single union in mainland China, which is in our eyes is the, belongs to the government department. And um, these two largest independent union, um, like Professional Teachers Union and Hong Kong Cabin Crew Federations, they are the affiliates of HKCTU, which is the pan-democratic. And that's why we believe, um, especially these two unions members, they are always under attack. Carol, thank you. Can you give us an idea of um, how uh, various groups of workers, uh, both unionized or ununionized, um, uh, dis made decisions to enter into the protest. Was it your observation that it was just, it was sort of individuals feeling the pressure to participate because of their own beliefs, or were they organized within the structure of the unions? That the unions were they able to support and help this or did they have to stand aside for fear of further retaliation from the government? I think the basic concept about unions in Hong Kong um, wasn't that wide enough in the past. Um, the union's um, density in Hong Kong is about 20%. It's not quite quite big, but of course it's not far from some other developing countries. But the situation is um, because the young generations are young workers, they have a um, very weak concept about union in the past. On developing the movement, they suddenly remember, oh, shall we um, do something similar like a union? For example, strike. And student strike, worker strike, business strike, um, if we worked together, we could cripple the business uh, operations in the entire Hong Kong. So let's stop Hong Kong for one day. This is how they came from, but they don't know the details. So some of the um, young people, when they started to organize themselves um, through Telegram or a particular chatting forum is called LinkedIn, they, they're realizing it's um, how about those traditional unions? And um, lots of them, they, they still quite resist um, traditional unions to take the lead. And because the, the movement itself, when we first start in June, it, the main goal for everyone is be water. That means um, no particular leader, it's the leaderless movement. And um, let's um, organize through different platforms like Telegram by ourselves. We, we still can do things collectively without a traditional leader or platform. This is how they believe. But subsequently, when they start to organize a big assembly, they, they started to touch a, a problem. It's how about those logistic, how, how to set up a, um, a stage in a big area, who's connecting who? And then they started to thinking about how about asking the expertise of HKCTU. When they come to us, they, they're, they're very nice people. They started to discuss with us, it's like, um, we still don't want a usual big uh, platform, big leader. We just work together with you. Is that okay? Of course, we say, okay. Yeah, we are part of the civil society. We are one member in the society, so let's work together. So we do it bit by bit together. And also to make the, um, the strike on 5th of August sex, because the young ones, they mobilized themselves, including HKCTU and the affiliates. We went to the streets, different um, subway station. We down on our knees in front of the public, holding our placards to begging everyone, could you tomorrow just sacrifice one day for the young people? Just stop working one day in order to stop the city. And it, it just uh, touched a lot of the people's hearts. And for myself, we went to the one of the railway station, the main entrance, we doing the white wrist banners. We write something on the wrist and uh, on, the, on the ribbon and tied on the public's hand and saying that tomorrow will be our strike, please support. And um, of course, um, next morning, 
some young gen young people they start their civil disobedience uh, movement by damaging certain subway station too it stopped the public transport basically on that morning so we able to gather the 350,000 in seven places but i think um, they have a feeling they not resist the traditional um, union anymore they start to building working relationship with us bit by bit and alongside with the strike different sectors i i remember at least 29 different sectors that we never able to organize them they come into a group by group and they also talk about how about after the movement shall we form our own union as well so this is something we, we never expect that happen we only afraid is the young they are very afraid or they they really mind um our old-fashioned organizations they don't want us to to participate too much but actually after they taste how collective power it is how structural situations they need it so um they gradually develop among themselves less became a union this is something really great i just need to tell you very quick limitations in mm. hong kong's law and um the a traditional union we only collect a very low amount of the dues so someone just some unions could be just collecting about maybe ten dollars less than 10 us dollars a year for 12 months so that will be no strike funds able to accumulate during a strike it's rather difficult to uh, financially assist people but we learn from this now so we, they, i think some of the unions now changing the ways they're doing and um yeah again it's the law itself is not very protecting in any pol political strike if there is a, a economical strike that means a labor dispute about money about terms and conditions there's still a, a law here in hong kong to to give a very small amount of the protections not very very good but if you, we talk about a political strike less focus to the government and um, there's no laws to cover it i think the, the big, big thing in the coming future for Hong Kong legislators is how to revert such situations without collective bargaining law in Hong Kong. How do we work? Carol, this was a magnificent uh, explanation of an unusually um, dialectical process, if you will, where, um, as you say, the protesters themselves, especially the young protesters, uh, came to understand uh, what they wish to pursue, a leaderless, uh, non-hierarchical movement, and yet recognizing the strength and continuity of the institutional presence of HKCTU, it sounds like this is also changing uh, your unions as well, opening people up to the idea of this form of militancy. It's, it's a profound transformational moment. Um, thank you so much for evoking it for us. Let's um, go now from this, this broad sweep uh, of uh, thousands of people and many, many sectors and look at the particular sector um, of air traffic in which, as we know, traditionally in logistics, we would have said, you know, for many decades, it was going to be the dock workers um, who could sort of choke off global trade. We now see, of course, the incredible centrality of uh, air traffic. And um, so we're going to return turn to uh, Rebecca Sai. Rebecca, as people know, is the president of the uh, Air Flight Attendants Association, who was punished directly for her uh, own involvement, was sacked along with these 36 other employees. Rebecca, can you please uh, talk to us a little bit about your own decision-making process as uh, you and your fellow union members uh, realized that you needed to enter into these protests in various forms? how you did that. Um, uh, hello, process. everyone. Um, this is Rebecca, and I was from uh, Cathay Dragon, one of the Cathay Pacific group. And uh, since June, as everybody knows, we got a lot of assemblies and protests in Hong Kong. And it is to about the withdrawal of the extradition bill. And all the Hong Kong workers, and of course, including the um, our employees, our colleagues, we all believe we have to come out, to stand out, to protect the safety and freedom of Hong Kong, like the freedom of expression. This is what we most concern. So we encouraged our members to join 
with members from other trade unions, just like uh, organized by Hong Kong CTU, and also as well as all the Hong Kong people in Hong Kong, we decided to join the protests. For example, the 9th of June, the 12th of June are the two major protests in Hong Kong. We got 1 million and 2 million people. And we already posed uh, on, even on our website to encourage our members even you are no members, as long as, long as you are the workers in uh, aviation industries, not just Cathay Pacific, we encourage all the people to go on the street to tell everyone that we connect with Hong Kong people. Uh, we believe um, every time when we're calling for support from the public, I mean the aviation industry, like even um, our unions, we got a big support and like, we got a lot of support from the public. And we hope by um, telling everyone that we are willing to go out to walk together with all the Hong Kong people to show, although we are all always working in the sky, but actually we do know what's happening in Hong Kong as well, because Hong Kong is still, after all, our hometown. And we believe um, the 5th of August, the citywide strike uh, that we call our members to support as well, did trigger um the chinese government uh, we believe uh it is a trigger point that why we are being targeted by the chinese uh, aviation authority because they know uh the sit-in uh in july 26 of uh, july we have organized also like uh carol mentioned we help uh, those uh, young kids to organize a sit-in in the airport and that's it's 11 hours sit-in in the airport and everybody has witnessed how successful it was because they know uh, the Hong Kong International Airport is a very safe place to do the protest. And they know the uh, protest organized or we call, we call workers working together with uh, the young generation could make the things so successful and peaceful. And we could effectively tell everyone what we want and what are the five demands and what the young generation, how uh, dedicated they are to uh, and the effort put in in this whole movement. And we are very glad that all our members, they don't care about, really, they don't care about their career, but they care about the future of Hong Kong more. So, although we actually we're glad uh, even our chairman, former chairman, John Sloza has made a speech after the 5th of August strike. He made a speech in a conference on 7th. In his speech, he said um, he respects all the staff in Cathay Pacific group. We we're talking about like almost 30,000 staff. And he did say that uh, with all those staff who come from different countries with different cultural backgrounds, we have different political stance and views. But after all, we still need to respect each other. We have to embrace the differences and that what makes Cathay Pacific Group so special and so unique. And we are very glad that, and all our members and workers are glad that our chairman would have made such a speech that is a, such a big encouragement to us. But we never would have believed that now even he has to step down and the most shocking news of course is about our former ceo and the coo that is rupert hawk and the paul lu they need to we believe they're forced to resign from the post especially after the cac have uh, announced three special regulations to cathay group and all these we we can say uh, it is very new and also uh, a, a quite a big defeat to the aviation industry in Hong Kong and we believe it surely affects all the industries in Hong Kong as well because we uh, Cathay Pacific Group as a large cooperation in Hong Kong large company we believe the Chinese government target on us to show how big their influence could be and how they could threaten the survival of a corporation corporate that would just scare you and to ask you to think twice before you really want to do something for Hong Kong. But we tell everyone that we're not scared. Um, although I've been sacked, but I'm sure this news would even bring us together. 
my termination, actually, um, of course, everyone is sad, um, but my members and my colleagues, they know how terrible it could be if we really want to step back and just keep silent because next one will be you, yourself. So they decided to um, ask the help from the public and also to, we're glad that we got the support from uh, all of you as well and from other trade unions. Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit about the way in which you have observed uh, these events have increased um, the, the closeness, the understanding between members of the general public and uh, workers who are in unions? Would you say, as Carol did, that there seems to be a growing understanding of the importance of uh, workers banding together and acting? And if so, what have you seen? Well, I've seen, um, uh, we can say it's a new Hong Kong now, because uh, everyone knows, uh, although uh, there's, no, 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 there's not a big platform to organize all the events, but uh, since June or since August, after those uh, strike and also those big protests, everyone know the individual power. When we unite together and when we connect, it could be a big power and could be uh, influencing each other. And it is a way to show support to each other as well. You can never underestimate one's power can make things change and uh, they're not scared anymore even you go on the street by yourself or try to express your opinion Bef before uh, uh, we could never seen uh, all hong kong people could be could be so brave to do or to walk on the street by themselves without any big organization uh telling you what to do and there's no instructions at all we already so used get used to it every weekend from friday to sunday everybody know what to do that is to go on the street and to tell everyone that we are still fighting for what we want and we won't step back there's you don't have any timetable or timeline it's already marked in your mind and of course after weekend we still go to work and um like a normal workers but in our hearts or in all our free time we, on our social media everyone is so connected and we have a or everyone share the big picture it is, is to ask the government about the five demands and they need to deal with it yes remarkable Bef and before we turn to um sarah nelson can i ask you to talk a little bit about what uh you have received and seen by way of international solidarity uh from other other unions around the world and what sort of impact that has had I'm sorry, did you hear me? Rebecca? Oh, Rebecca, I think you are, you were on mute. Try again. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. I'm here. Did yeah. you hear my question? Uh, I thought you're, you're, you're talking to Sarah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I was, <laughs> okay. sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'd love to hear about about your experience of uh, receiving well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, international yeah, yeah. solidarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm 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 really grateful that um we have received so many supports from different trade unions. Like uh, I've mentioned earlier, uh, after my termination, uh, we didn't even uh, have really proactively announced what's happened to me, but some. Uh, it was covered by film media or some press and we already got tons of email from uh, different trade unions and of course uh, from uh, ITF and they are showing their support and tell us that we don't have to be afraid because we're uh, in solidarity. We are, we clearly know that what's, how the company tried to defeat the trade union, but um, we are connected with other trade unions from all over the world and we don't feel scared because we know we will get the support from the from the different trade unions internationally um, 
and they would know what's happening in Hong Kong is totally unfair. And we hope uh, the situation will get better soon. And we really thank, we feel so thankful for what they have done to us. Rebecca, thank you. A very, uh, very deeply grounded and authentic account of what you've been through. And again, I think everybody can, can hear uh, in your and Carol's comments the transformational nature of what's going on. This is not, cannot be understood as just a, a normal strike or a normal social protest. This is transforming the very uh, lifeblood yeah. of social movement. Um, thank you so much. And Rebecca, before we turn to Sarah Nelson, I'd just like to remind uh, people that are watching and participating in this, in this webinar that you can post questions. Um, and in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, we'll turn to those questions. Uh, we probably will not be able to get to all of them, but we'll be happy to answer as many as we can. So you can put them in your chat function. Sarah. Um, you have a very interesting connection uh, to this story. Um, uh, Sarah, as people know, is the president of the AFA, um, which is affiliated with the communication workers. Uh, uh, Sarah has really been um, uh, carving important ground and using uh, the power and the pulpit that she has uh, to demand that a, a broader social justice agenda um, be, be taken up by our labor movement. And it has certainly included uh, solidarity um, for the uh, fallen, fallen sisters in Hong Kong. Sarah, welcome. Uh, please uh, talk about your own involvement in this case and particularly about uh, your union's organization representation of the US-based um, crew of Cathay Pacific. You just bargained their first contract. Yes. Um, ironically, we achieved that contract in July this summer. So as the um, protests were taking off and heating up, um, we actually were able to close out that contract um, with the management who now has resigned, I should note. Um, so let me back up for just a minute and um, remind everyone or tell everyone for the first time that uh, Cathay Pacific has bases in San Francisco, LA, and New York. Um, the Cathay Pacific flight attendants voted overwhelmingly 97% in January of 2017 to join AFA after the company had found a loophole in tax code um, to stop paying into the social systems in the United States. So to stop paying into Social Security and Medicare and stripping the flight attendants who live in the U.S. of um, their retirement security. So they organized very quickly with AFA and um, we were successful in finally getting a first contract. Um, felt that there had been actually a lot of um, well, we got a lot of support, I should say, from our, our sisters and brothers in Hong Kong, um, but uh, worked really um, to achieve that contract, to achieve that retirement security here in the U.S. Um, those flight attendants fly many times with Hong Kong-based crew, but they fly directly from San Francisco to Hong Kong, go to a... Uh, a, a place outside the city to have their layovers. Um, sometimes we'll interface with family that they have in Hong Kong, and they're mostly they're mostly very much connected to um, to Hong Kong or mainland China. Uh, we also have a base in Hong Kong for United Airlines, and it is a base that has been open for over 20 years. It flies, we, uh, the flight attendants there are on our seniority list in the U.S., and the um, United Airlines uh, U.S.-based contract uh, governs their working conditions. Um, those flight attendants have been out at these protests and participating, and certainly participated in the August protest at the airports, um, and are very supportive, but I will tell you that this is, it is extremely important for our unions to be talking about what is happening in Hong Kong because um, there is so much going on in the U.S. right now that um, it is very hard to break through on those issues. Um, one of the ways that we talk about this with our members, because I, I will tell you our members who live in Hong Kong, um, there are a small number of them who are married, for example, to the local Hong Kong 
Klung police and don't want our union speaking up. Um, we have spoken up anyway and continue to press forward. Um, we also have members um, in uh, the Catholic Pacific bases who are very supportive of the statements that we have made, but um, I think um, are very concerned about um, how to really intercede here um, as CAFE employees. And I think uh, Carol will tell you that um, one thing that is um, uh, a tried and true um, tactic, and I would say coming from mainland China and now uh, Catholic Pacific management who will follow their orders, is to have a list of people and to pick them off one by one. Uh, and so people have been led to believe that if they keep their heads down or if they follow the new social media policy of the uh, providing uh, being a whistleblower for mainland China, um, that they can somehow preserve their own jobs. And the truth is that there are thousands of people on the list who are targeted. Um, and if what we have to do is spread the word that if we really act together and take the actions that Rebecca and Carol were talking about and that solidarity that is building up and the idea that workers can have power. I was so excited to hear Rebecca talk about the transformation psychologically of the Hong Kong workers um, who are going out on the weekends and who are not waiting for anyone to tell them, but understanding that this is a way of life, that they have to stand up and they have to stand for these rights because um, there is this idea that if one and that is spreading throughout Hong Kong, um, through these actions that we need to actually spread more around the rest of the world and get more people to participate in that if one person is hurt we are all in jeopardy of being hurt and an injury to one is an injury to all um, and so we are trying to have those conversations actually with our members uh, to think and talk about how they can be um, more active in that but also to spread the word throughout the U.S. because um, what's happening in China is very much what the government in the U.S. right now um, is trying to um, sow throughout the United States with taking away unions' rights and trying to get people to be silenced and trying to get people to keep their head down. Um, and so this idea that workers around the world are getting out in the streets and feeling like they need to um, stand up for not only their rights but and and not be so worried about their profession or their job that they have today because the understanding that the very foundational um, uh, idea of uh, individual expression, freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of protest is on the line here, um, that it doesn't matter what profession they may have, that profession is never going to afford them the kind of life that they want for themselves or for their children if they're not standing up together. So we are trying to inspire that conversation. I'm actually talking about this quite often everywhere I go. Um, I've got the entire airline industry um, all gathered together in one room tomorrow. Uh, airlines, manufacturers, airports, U.S. airline industry in one room together tomorrow in Washington, and this will be a key part of my speech to them. Um, but we have to understand that aviation, one, one thing that I talk about with our members and with other people in the airline industry is that the only reason that aviation works is because people actually can go and buy a ticket and think in their minds, I can go anywhere in the world. And when that is clamped down on, when that is denied, that will, that will choke out the airline industry. So if, if you have, um, management even, you know, heads of these businesses um, or union leaders or individual workers have to understand that this is not something that is happening to someone else. This is something that is threatening our very right to um, have our, our industry and the basis for our jobs and the basis for um, our ability to move around the world and make these connections with other people. So, um, so it's, 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 a constant effort to get people into the conversation and help them understand why this means something to them. Um, and that's, that's what we are trying to promote with our members, even within our membership ranks. Um, but we're going to keep speaking up and keep spreading the word and keep raising awareness and um, keep cheering on Rebecca and Carol. And I just want to also note that um, it is quite extraordinary that around the world, uh, flight attendants, and women in particular are leading the way on militant action um, and leading the way on um, showing um, our families and our communities how to really um, love in action.
And uh, I, I just really want to, I, I can't um, say enough about how much I look up to Rebecca and Carol and how much of a he heroes they are to me. Um, and uh, I want to thank them very much for everything they're doing. So I don't know if it's time for questions, but. <laughs> can, can I just um, give some um, suggestions? It's the, the latest um, example happening in the NBA. Uh, I think mm. most Americans they are wearing. And when the, um, the chief executive, Adam Silver, and um, they, he expressed that when mainland Chinese officials uh, instructed him to fire Daryl Morey. And this is how the, um, when a company or, or a business um, entity, then they seeing the power of mainland China and exactly how happening what, about what Rebecca says. When the CAAC instructed the airline, I don't like this particular person, fire him or fire her. How can a business company to resist such an order? And um, look at NBA. At the moment, they're still able to resist because of various reasons. But on the airlines, you see, um, China, mainland Chinese government through the CAAC very, very clever to manipulate the airspace. This is the only weapon they can manipulate to ransom any business entity saying that unless you don't want to do business with us, we won't let you fly into or over our skies. So I think this is one of the things and um, one of the very important examples to show to the world um, how much and how big of the power from the mainland Chinese government. If they want to control a place, they want to control a place politically, they will first start from the finance control from a place, from the place um, company. So um, this is a very typical too extreme that's showing in front of everyone's eyes. Hi, are you are people able to hear me? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I've been having, I've been having some uh, technical problems. Hi. Um, are, are people able to, to hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. Can I, really, see you. I really apologize. Um, let me try and read some questions for you in the last few minutes. My, my um, computer seems to be unstable. Um, I have a question about uh, that comes in like this. Um, Beyond uh, adopting the five demands, what will it Is it what was the five demands? I can't So hear. I think, Carol, the, the question is, I can read it here. Um, yeah. That the question was beyond um, adopting the five demands, what will it take uh, uh, for to, to win uh, the 2019 protests? To win. I think that among the protesters and the, and the city still thinking about the retaliation economically and uh, not local economically or perhaps international retaliations economically. So um, is there any other ways to um, a kind of um, siege around the world to tell and instruct it um, to us back to the mainland China? It's, um, it's, it's a democratic um, international society here. It's not only you, mainland China, you want to do um, how to do the things, all right? So I think this is some of the ideas came up um, during these movements. And if we want to make sure that the, the people in Hong Kong able to win, 
in my mind at this stage, it's how to make international solidarity or international support became more stronger. When more and more countries, especially big countries, um, different organizations or workers' organizations or public, to show their support, to show their resistance about how um, Chinese government, you, if you still penetrating your um, political power through um, economical means, um, something if you don't meet or um, to fulfill the international um, kind of rules, for example, giving human rights or workers' rights, um, we will support Hong Kong until they get it. So I think some of the um, the situation develops throughout these few months. It's how much of the international solidarity we're able to get. The very first things coming up, I think, is the American Congress. It's going to pass one of the bill, isn't it, about the uh, Hong Kong Human Rights Act. I think this is one of the very, very significant move, international solidarity and the international support. And of course, it still needs some time, maybe weeks, to wait until um, the Senate to pass, isn't it? Uh, but the, the situation in Hong Kong is everyone is monitoring what's happening in U.S. Congress. And it shows a reflection to um, mainland Chinese government is um, they can't just try to do even more stronger retaliations towards Hong Kong workers is a way out. They need to respond to the international world. That's excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I appear to have solved my um, technical problems, I believe. Um, we have another question. Um, do Hong Kong people want an independent Hong Kong state? Um, I, I, although I'm, I can't represent 7.5 million people to say, but majority opinion in Hong Kong, we, we are not asking for Hong Kong independence. No, we just need to make sure back to 22 years ago when we hand back to uh, mainland China and the, what the British government and the mainland Chinese government, they have been agreed a joint declaration, how to maintain one country, two systems. This one country, two system means to maintain as long as at least 50, five, zero, 50 years of the same way of living what we used to be. So at this moment, um, throughout this movement, it's showing this one country, two system situations now is deteriorating. Gradually is moving on like what we became or what we will become one of the major cities in mainland China. That means you won't have your um, critical thinking, you can't criticize your government, your freedom of expressions, freedom of assembly could be jeopardized or being taken away. You look at what latest happening the, at the face mask ban, the legislation just coming overnight by flicking the fingers. So it's really worrying each and every one across different ages group. It's what's going to happen a year later or later or later. So we just want to make sure um, Chinese government, please do what you have been promised when that year we hand back to Hong Kong, when those years that our politicians, our representatives have been talk and negotiate together with the mainland Chinese government. Don't take in away the words, all right? This is how and why the people insist. We don't want to become those um, cities like one of the Shanghai or Beijing, and you have no a human rights activists. You can't have a workers activists to uh, protect people's rights and the freedom of speech. We don't want that. So that's why we insist so long and so much. Thank you. We have a number more questions we're going to try and get to. Someone asks, what is the relationship between the militant labor movement on the ground in protests and immigrant domestic workers, most predominantly from uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, how do you think this relationship speaks to the broader labor movement and its overlap with immigrant rights? Of course, this is highly relevant for us in the US given that uh, migrant workers' right is so central to the labor question here. Carol, that might fall to you. You are getting a disproportionate number of questions, but would you like to ask that? <laughs> 
I, I think um, around this movement in Hong Kong, um, we never ignored any minorities' voices, including those immigrants or um, immigrant workers' rights. They, um, we have about 30, um, 300,000 of um, immigrant workers in Hong Kong, majority working as a domestic helpers, which is living with their employers together in one's, uh, one's home. And um, their voices and their um, supports was uh, playing um, a very unforgettable role as well. Although we know that, um, I'm not sure whether you guys are wearing, um, because the movement, um, we, the, the society have been split into two major colors, either yellow, which is the pan-democratic support the movement, support the protesters. The other side, which is blue, means pr um, support the police, support the government. In each family, you could have a yellow employer or a blue employer. How do these domestic workers able to support? They may be using their own days off every Sunday to come out and just uh, to go along with the rally or someone able to, to identify their employers, which is supporting the movement. They can talk to their employers. But I think among the um, immigrant workers union, they also showing a kind of support. And uh, so that's why we believe that don't ignore these uh, small groups of the um, foreign workers voices. Um, they've been using their own languages um, to writing some of the routine materials um, during some of the rallies or even spreading amongst their chat, chat groups in Telegram. I believe this is, um, Again, um, we're able to collect different kinds of the people's voices, including our immigrant workers together. And uh, perhaps they're able to voice to their consulate as well in Hong Kong. And I, I remember through our Philippines network, um, one of the protests happened in Philippines outside the Chinese consulate was taking place, I think, um, two months ago. It's showing a, a kind of support um, from Hong Kong extended to different countries as well. This is a very clear message to the mainland Chinese government. Support is came from everywhere. Don't ignore it. I think this is one of the um, scenarios we would like to share. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah, here's a question for you. Sarah, you said that you believe that the US government is trying to sow the same seeds that China is. Are you stating that here in the US, our government is trying to eliminate unions because we are the threat to the status quo of the oligarchy? Are they trying to instill fear in the people, losing our jobs as a mean of control? And the person who wrote this is a member of the IBEW. <laughs> Yes, well, I mean, the attack on unions is uh, absolutely about accruing all of the power and control um, to a small number of people, and that has been a 70-year assault, but it is on steroids with this administration. Um, and that, uh, if, you, if you look at the executive orders that are taking away, uh, seeking to take away the rights of the federal unions, for example, um, going in overnight, uh, t uh, taking the locks out of union offices, uh, closing those offices, denying workers the uh, time off necessary to uh, provide due process rights, uh, denying collective bargaining. Um, this is all about taking away the last check in our democracy against total uh, power and control um, of a select few. And so, yes, I think that this is uh, the attacks on uh, workers' rights are absolutely that first and last step uh, towards taking away uh, any ability for people in the country to rise up and, um, and fight back. Uh, because that sets up a situation um, that Carol and Rebecca are describing, which is going after businesses financially and trying to put pressure on businesses financially to control the employees. And without unions there, they can create the they can use the threat of um, losing your job or losing your rights on the job um, in order to try to control people and isolate people. And we see that today. Um, in union organizing campaigns where employers will um, find ways to get rid of the uh, union supporters 
and to isolate people through things like um, isolating on their health care, um, uh, providing uh, schedules that deny them the right to get that health care, or um, making it very difficult for someone to access um, workers' comp benefits. And people who are very much isolated because they're going through an individual problem at work that where you don't have a union contract that addresses these issues for the entire workforce and the ability to enforce those rights. Um, that people can very much be isolated and um, moved away if they are someone who is not afraid to use their voice. Um, so um, I, I think that actually your question had the answer within it, um, but let me just verify that I would agree. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to wrap up uh, now. I'd like to ask um, each of the three of you to just uh, reflect. We've had several questions that have come in sort of saying, what would be something useful, useful activities for Americans either in unions or in other uh, pro-labor formations uh, to do that might be uh, uh, supportive of the social insurgency in Hong Kong. Uh, let's take a moment and ask each of the three of you if you have some suggestions. Rebecca, shall we start with you? Well, um, I'm very impressed when uh, we talk about um, Sarah just mentioned about the isolation. I mean, the company or the Chinese government tried to use a white terror, and it, I saw this one is mentioned in one of the questions. They talk about the white terror is really, um, everybody really terrified by the white terror, and people dare not to speak up, and you never know each other's idea or their political view, and this is how they isolate the workers, and uh, trying to ask the workers, you just need to focus to protect your job. Because once you lose your job, you can't even do what you, whatever you want. And uh, it is a kind of, the workers feel so frightened and they're very upset and disappointed with the company as well. And I hope uh, the workers will get the idea that, um, although you can't express your idea on the social media, but as long as you know that we got so many support um, from all the Hong Kong people and people outside Hong Kong, in, that is the support from internationally, you can just go on the street and express your view by action. You don't have to post anything on the social media. And as long as you do what you believe in, that is for uh, Greater Hong Kong to um, help to save Hong Kong, then um, you don't have to be afraid and you will get the power already. Uh, from different people all over the world. You don't have to be afraid. That is very good and big um, support from you guys and from different people in the world. We are very, it's very touching. And um, thank you so much. Rebecca, thank you. Sarah, do you have some thoughts about the role that steps that can be taken in the US? You would like to encourage everyone to take. Well, I would really encourage every single union hall to talk about this issue and to express support. Um, I think that uh, what's very important is to share the information. Um, as I said, what, I've, what I'm finding is that as I talk about this uh, around the country, um, there is um, there is sort of a shock uh, um, that I'm bringing it up with all of the issues that we have to deal with here. Oftentimes, people are very focused on what's right in front of them. Um, and then um, a, desire, a, a desire to learn more. And where there seems to be a crowd that is more aware of what's going on, um, it, when we're not talking about these things in the union halls, then we're giving, um, we're giving propaganda a chance to, um, to sow seeds into people's heads and into their consciousness. And so we have to take on these issues in our union halls. I would encourage everyone to bring this back to your local union and, and bring an action item forward. Um, there is an ITF resolution um, that we have posted on afacwa.org that people can take and use as a platform. Um, we can certainly um, provide them with other resources um, and um, help uh, Carol and Rebecca in doing that as well. Labor Notes has some uh, incredible resources on the issue as well. Um, but we need to be talking about this. We need to be passing resolutions. We need to be um, providing those support statements and encouraging our government to act. So our government does need to pass this resolution, resolution does need to take action and hold China accountable uh, for these human rights violations. Uh, because we, we cannot 
we cannot allow this to go on and allow this to go unchecked. And it is absurd that the United States has not sent us a, a more swift message of support and condemnation of these human rights violations. So these are the things that we need to do, but we need to understand that we need to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and build this support within our workplaces so that we can, um, so that we can get our politicians to understand that we're paying attention, um, that this matters to us, and um, that we need them to act. Excellent, Sarah, thank you so much for that uh, rallying cry to us all. And uh, Carol, let's close out with you. Last thoughts. Right. All right. I think I um, really appreciate um, this chance to let us to explain to so many people in one go. Um, from now on, I believe no matter what kind of the unions you belong to, no matter is aviation or not, a particular aviation, and I think that the union should first of all take the very first move and the lead towards the, their own employer is telling them, um, make sure any workers in the workplace are protected, they're free from the, any kind of threats. Even they're showing um, their stance to support Hong Kong workers or Hong Kong people, they should not be subject to any penalty or any kind of intimidation. And this is what the union can do. Um, to tell everyone in the in the workplace in the country that unions can give support and pro and the um, protections to anyone, and also I would like to encourage everyone to support any kinds of activities at your own local places if you see they are supporting um, the Hong Kong's protest or protesters. I know the university students group, they are already start their tour in America and uh, internationally to explain to the um, educational field or politi some politicians in America and um, um, how about our workers, our unions representatives can do and um, we, we could be following. But um, don't forget, um, um, this is one of the main steps we in around the world we can help each other and also if you see this is a fundraising program supporting particular industry like um, um, Rebecca and the aviation workers who get dismissed who are in the hardship and um, please do all what you can um, support um, financially even just one dollar and um, that helps then um, last but not least is um, how to monitor the situations and giving enough recommendations towards the US Congress, for example, if the bill is, is passed, and to give enough recommendations to give sanctions to any particular business firms. This is one of the future works. I think me, Sarah, and more um, union fellows can do it um, in after today. We need to make sure um, how your side um, can receive um, very clear message from Hong Kong is which company is doing those things now. They are spreading the white terror towards their workers and they need to be sanctioned. They need to be um, um, monitored and or perhaps uh, punished in certain ways and just like what we um, recommended some a lot of the signature petitions uh, when those uh, senior police officers still try to apply um, the immigrants status um, in US and um, do they know they are actually breaching some kind of human rights and etc cetera, etc cetera. so so many different things um, I recommend that no matter at your side or around the world people um, the, the supporters can do and uh, or, and within the unions. So I very much hope um, the um, international um, support carry on and don't forget um, what's happening in Hong Kong today. It could be happen on you later. Carol, thank you so much. Um, I would like to remind everybody who is listening that you will have another opportunity and perhaps the opportunity to uh, meet these brave warriors face to face at the Labor Notes Biennial Conference, which is in April in Chicago. Uh, we're very honored to bring representatives of the Hong Kong Dock Workers Union after their historic strike in 2013. I'm sure we will want to welcome uh, our sisters and brothers from Hong Kong. It's an extraordinary opportunity for uh, rank and file activists uh, and militant trade unionists from around the world to gather. Uh, we will look forward to um, hearing the con continuation of your story and your struggle then. Uh, thanks to everybody for your time and especially to our speakers. Um, solidarity and stand with Hong Kong. 
Solidarity forever. Solidarity. Good night. Good night. Good night. Solidarity.